In this video, I'm going to work through two examples of an event study, and I'm using what's probably a somewhat dated example here, um, but, but I'm looking at when Microsoft initiated their, their dividend in 2003, and then when they announced an increase in their dividend and announced a, a special, fairly large dividend in 2004. We're going to look at how the market responded to both of these dividend announcements. I like to use this because then I can also talk about how uh, dividends, dividend initiations, dividend increases, things like that affect the value of the company. So I have two different items open. Uh, for the first one's called Microsoft Event Study, and the other is named the Event Study. It's XLSM. There is a macro uh, to help show what I'm doing in the uh, Excel functions and Excel formulas that I, I I have within the workbook. So if it asks you to, if it's all right, you know, gives you a little yellow warning message, you can go ahead and, and check that it's it's fine to open this with the macros enabled. There's nothing dangerous about the macros in here. Uh, so I'm going to start off by just going through the two different announcements. Uh, the first announcement was on January 16, 2003. Microsoft was the first major technology company or internet computer firm to announce the initiated, initiation of a regular dividend. And this came about three years after the internet bubble burst. So Microsoft was one of obviously one of the survivors of that that bubble burst and had started generating and and accumulating a lot of cash. The announcement of a dividend increase usually receives a positive reaction in the marketplace as it communicates increasingly stable income to investors. Also, and the reason for this is that a company doesn't want to commit to a dividend or a dividend increase, a larger dividend, unless they have fairly high certainty that they're going to be able to maintain that in the future. Likewise, the announcement of a dividend decrease usually results in a significant negative return on the day of the announcement, and that's simply because the management recognizes at that point that they can no longer sustain the level of the dividend they've been paying, and it sends a bad signal about the future of the firm's earnings and cash flows and stability of those uh, to the market. Dividend initiations, so just starting a dividend when there wasn't one. However, generally have a mixed response. Not always positive, not always negative, or generally not always positive or negative. While they are actually dividend increases, you're going from zero to something, they can also signal to the market that the firm is entering into a new stage in its life cycle, going from a growth firm to, hopefully, a cash cow. Investors that like to invest in growth firms don't always respond positively to this change. And at this point, to give you a little foreshadowing, at this point, Microsoft was a high growth firm. They were, you think of the BCG metrics, they were a star. They were increasing market share in a growing industry. So this dividend initiation sent a message to the marketplace. For this announcement, what we're going to do is determine the abnormal returns for Microsoft, surrounding the announcement date using a single factor model, the S&P 500, is going to be our market proxy, and then a two-factor model using the iShares S&P North American Technology Sector Index Fund. The ticker for that is IGM for the industry proxy. Our announcement date is January 16th, 2003, and the event period is January 14th, 2003 through January 21st, 2003. The estimation period is approximately a year long. It's January 15th, 2002 through January 13th, 2003. So let's go ahead and do this one first. And then we'll move on to the second announcement. On the first worksheet in our workbook, and it's named Dividend 1, I've highlighted the event period. So January 14th, 2003 through January 21st, 2003. And I've provided the adjusted prices from Yahoo Finance for the estimation period. You can see that all the way down here. And for the event period. Uh, over time, so if, if you were to look up these prices today, they might be different because they are adjusted based on dividend payments and also any stock splits or dividend, excuse me, stock dividends. And so these are the prices for this period as of the date I pulled those up from Yahoo Finance. First thing we want to do is calculate the returns for, the, for Microsoft, the market, and the industry. 
here I'll put in equal, actually I'm going to rename this, mktret, and this I'll put igmret, and this I'm going to name msftret. So I'm going to put in equal natural log of the most recent return divided by the pre excuse me, the most recent price divided by the previous price. I'll pull that over through the industry and pull that all the way down. We won't include the, the first observation because we'll just get an error message if we were to do that. So again, and I'll make this a little nicer here. I'll change this color so we can highlight just the event period. There we go. And so our event date is right here, January 16th. So we have those returns, and again, it's the natural log of the most recent return, or excuse me, the most recent price, divided by the previous price. So what we need to do next is calculate our market model. What I want to do here is name the returns during the estimation period. So I'm not going to name the entire column, just the ones during the estimation period. To do this, I put for Microsoft, I put my cursor on E7, hold down Control Shift, and then the down arrow. So I highlight all those returns. And I'll name these MSFTRET for Microsoft return. I'll do the same for the market return. Again, Control Shift and then down arrow and put in M -A -M -K -T -R -E -T. and then finally for the industry return, which is IGM return. So for my single, single factor model, I'm regressing the returns of Microsoft on the returns for the market. I'm not including the industry returns yet. So my intercept in this case is going to be equal to intercept my known y, so my dependent variable is the Microsoft return. My known x's are the market return. Press enter. So the intercept is essentially zero. The slope, or the beta, is equal to slope, Microsoft return, market return. It's 1.28. So Microsoft has more than average market risk at this point in time, which is understandable. They're a high growth company, uh, probably uh, fairly sensitive to the macro economy and, and things going on with the market as a whole. The standard error in this case, this is the standard errors of the, of the predicted Ys for, the give it for each value of X. So the command here in Excel is STEYX, so we put in the known y's and then the known x's. So finally we get the r square. This is equal to r square msft ret mkt ret. And so what that last one means is that this model does an okay job of explaining the returns for Microsoft. So the model explains about 61.4% of the variation in the returns for Microsoft. So our normal return is equal to the return for Microsoft minus the intercept. I'm going to lock this one in place. To lock this cell, I'm going to, and, and what that means is I, I want to make it so when I drag this down, I want this cell to point to, continue to point to J12. So I'm going to press the button F4, and that puts the dollar signs in front of the column and the row for the cell, so that won't change as I drag this formula down. Mul uh, plus the beta. Again, I'm going to press F4, multiplied by the market return for that day. So I'll highlight those. 
our t statistic then for each day. And so these are the abnormal returns for each day. We see a fairly large one on the day after the announcement. And I'll explain why that is why that occurred on that date in a moment. But the t statistic is equal to the abnormal return divided by the standard error that we calculated down here. And again, I want to lock that one in place. So I'm going to put F4. The, the number for the T stat that we use to determine if the response was statistically significant, the T statistic we use to determine if the abnormal, re, abnormal return is statistically significant is 1.96. Uh, what that mean, what that tells us is, is that at that point, there's only a 5% chance that the abnormal return is due to random chance. So if it's greater than 1.96, it means there's even a lower chance that the return is a result of uh, just random chance. So to ask if it's statistically significant, we put in equals. If the t stat, oh, excuse me, if the absolute value of the t stat is greater than 1.96, then the answer is yes. It's statistically significant. If it's less than, which is the other option, the value of false, the answer is no. And so we find here that On January 17, 2003, there was a statistically significant abnormal return for Microsoft of negative 5.5%. The reason why it occurred the day after the event date, the announcement date, is because in this case, as in many other cases, that announcement is actually made after the market closes for the day. So it's not going to be reflected in the actual date of the announcement. It'll be reflected in the following day. So the cumulative abnormal return is the total of the abnormal returns during the event window. So here, to calculate that, I start with the abnormal return for the first day in the event window. And to that, I add each of the abnormal returns during the event window to get to the last day of the event window. And what we see here is that the cumulative abnormal return during the event window was negative 4.03%. So in terms of value for Microsoft shareholders, the, the value, the market cap of the firm actually dropped fairly significantly over that five days. The next thing I want to do is a two factor model, which includes both the industry and the market to see if if controlling for market returns, so maybe there was something else happening on that day or during that time that affected all of the firms in the industry. So if we control for that, is it still statistically significant? So in this case, what we have to do is use a function called line S or line estimation in Excel to get to, to be able to use multiple independent variables. I I've, I've already set up kind of our table headings. So I want to select this area, which is N13 to P17. And then up here in the formula bar, I'm going to put equals line est. My known Ys are the Microsoft return. My known X's, I have to highlight both of my columns for both the market and the industry. And it goes on for a while here. Here we go. And then put a comma. The constant, so, and this is our intercept. We don't want to set that to zero. We want to have it calculate normally, so we're going to put in true. And we also want to include true here as well to include the additional 
regression statistics, put a close parenthesis, but don't press enter. Because this is an array or a matrix, we actually want to hold down control and shift and then enter. So hold down control and shift buttons and press enter. And it gives us this outcome. So I've already labeled different boxes here. So 0. 0.00051 is our intercept. 0. 0.66108 is the beta or the regression coefficient for the market. So it's kind of the beta from our single factor model. And 0. 0.43607 is the regression coefficient for the industry. So that shows the interaction between Microsoft returns and those of the industry. The standard errors, the standard error for the 0.43607 is 0 0.06677. For the market, it's 0.1174. And for the intercept, it's 0 0.00099. Based on these numbers, we could calculate a T-stat by dividing the slope by the standard error. We would find that the industry, industry slope is statistically significant and the market slope is statistically significant, but that the intercept is not statistically significant. The R-square is actually improved from our first model. It went from 0.6142 to 0 0.67099. This number here is, is an important number. Although it's not labeled in our table, this is actually the STY, STEYX that we calculated before, the standard area of the predicted Y values given the X values. So this will be our denominator in our test statistic above. So to calculate the abnormal return in this case, we take the return for Microsoft minus three, the intercept, and again I'll press F4, plus the market return, F, uh, the slope for the market return, and press F4, multiplied by the return for the market, plus the slope for the industry return, again, press F4, multiplied by the return for the industry. Close that out. We get 1.08. And then I'm going to pull that down. And so you see we get different outcomes. Our T stat will be equal to the abnormal return divided by standard error for the the y predicted y's given the x's and i want to press f4 here as well because i'm going to pull this t stat calculation down and so again what we see here is that on january 17 2003 there was a statistically significant response on the part of microsoft shareholders so was it statistically significant? Again, we're going to use that number 1.96 to determine that. If the absolute value of the t-stat is greater than 1.96, put in yes. If not, we put in no. And again, we see we get the same response here that on January 17th, there was a statistically significant response by the market to Microsoft's decision to initiate a dividend. The car, again, is equal to the abnormal return, the, the cumulative, the sum of all the abnormal returns during the event period. Pull that up again. So if we include the returns for the industry, then we get a cumulative abnormal return of 3.46%. So that's our first dividend. Let's move on now to our second dividend. Our second announcement occurred on July 20th, 2004. And at that time, Microsoft announced a special dividend of $3 per share, which was fairly sizable, 
which amounted to approximately $45 billion in cash being distributed to stockholders. This further communicated the move of Microsoft to being a cash cow as they were signaling that they didn't have opportunities in which to invest that cash. For this second announcement, determine the abnormal returns for Microsoft surrounding the announcement date using a single factor model, again using the S&P 500 as the market proxy, and a two factor model using, again, the IGM fund for the industry proxy. So go back to our spreadsheet, move to dividend two, and I'm gonna, uh, uh, Again, Nate, rename this to Microsoft Return and IGM Return. I'll calculate the returns in the same manner, equal LN. The most recent price divided by the previous price. I'll pull that over, pull it down all the way, leaving the last row empty because all we would get there is an error message. So I want to name my columns of returns. Clean this up. So during the estimation period, that's the period of time that I'll name them for. I can't name an MSFT return again because that's going to, that's already, there's already a column named that. So I'm going to be creative here and call it MSFT return two. The next column, market return two. And then finally, the last column, IGM return two. My single factor model, again, that's that market model. We're going to put intercept MSFT return, oops, return two, comma, and market return two. The next sell down slope, again, MSFT return two and market return two. Standard error, that's that S-T-E-Y-X. And then the R-square is R-S-Q, MSFT return two, market return two. So our R-square actually fell from the previous model from 0.6142 to 0.4005. So in this case, the market model doesn't do as good of a job at explaining the variation or the variability in Microsoft returns. The slope is actually lower in this case, so less market risk. So let's go ahead and calculate our abnormal returns. So my abnormal return is equal again to Microsoft's return minus the intercept, and again I'm going to press F4 here, plus the slope, again press F4, multiplied by the market return, and I get negative 2.18. So we actually see a, a fairly big increase in the abnormal returns. So we see a, a fairly large abnormal return on 721. So now we'll calculate the t-statistic to see if it's statistically significant. And again, I'm going to press F4 here so our standard error doesn't change. Then we want to see if it's statistically significant. Again, we're going to use number 1.96 to determine that.
And what we find is that there's actually two statistically significant dates. Um, one is on 721, and then the other is on 723. And what we actually see here is that this could be interpreted as a reversal in the large statistically significant abnormal return on 721. So the last thing we want to do here is look at the cumulative abnormal return to see what the net effect is, was over this event window. So we start with the first abnormal return during our event window. And we'll just go ahead and pull that up then. And so our cumulative abnormal return for the event window was a positive 3.02%, which again, in terms of Microsoft size, that's a, a fairly large increase in the value of Microsoft. So our final example is using the two-factor model. And we calculate it the same way that we did in our previous example. First, we start off by estimating the regression using two factors, the market and the industry. To do that, we start off by highlighting the table that we're going to create, and then putting in equals line S. Our known Ys, again, are going to be the Microsoft returns. And then our known Xs, we have to highlight those. That's the market return and the industry return. Then comma, then we put in true because we don't want the constant to be set to zero, and then true to give us the rest of the regression statistics. Now I'm going to hold down control shift and press enter. And again, that fills in that table we created. We can see that the, the regression coefficient for the market is 0.85, which is actually quite a bit lower than on our single factor model. And the coefficient for the industry is 0.21667, so it's fairly low. However, if we take into account the standard errors, both of these would be statistically significant. Again, the intercept would not be extremely low, it's almost zero, and it would not be statistically significant. The R squared is slightly improved from the one, the single factor model. It was 0 0.401, now it's 0.41526. And again, this number here, the 0 .0, the 0 0.01, 059 would be the standard error of our predicted y's given our x values. So our abnormal return would be calculated as the return for Microsoft minus the intercept. And again, we want to press F4 here, plus the slope for the market, press F4, multiplied by the market return. plus, plus the slope for the industry multiplied by the industry return. I'll pull this down again. As you can see, not a large difference between the abnormal return on July 21st between the single factor model and the two factor model. So let's calculate our t-statistics. Again, this is going to be the abnormal return divided by the standard error of 0 0.01059. Again, I'll press F4 so that stays in place. Pull that down. Is it statistically significant? And equals if the absolute value of the t-stat is greater than 1.96, the answer is yes. If it's not greater than 1.96, the answer is no. So the answer is no for the first one. Pull that down all the way, and we get a, a statistically significant outcome on July 21st, 
the inclusion of the second factor turns the abnormal return on July 23rd from being statistically significant to not being statistically significant. The cumulative abnormal return that is equal to the abnormal return, the, the sum of the abnormal returns during the event period that up all the way. So our cumulative abnormal return is 3.06 for the event period for the two-factor model compared to 3.02 for the single-factor model. So adding that additional factor here didn't change the outcome significantly. I like this just so you can see a little better when the returns were statistically significant. Right. So that finishes up this tutorial on event studies. Please let me know if you have any questions.